in terms of the research that I'm doing. I'm going to talk a little bit about the context um, to my research and sort of the practical work that I'm doing on the ground with networks. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some examples of social eating initiatives and what they're doing during the pandemic and are, are doing sort of going forward. Uh, and at the end of this, I've got a few links to articles and resources that you might find helpful. Um, and at the bottom left of this um, screen, you can see uh, on this slide that my Twitter handle, and if you want my email address, my university email address, I can share that with, uh, with you afterwards as well. Um, so broadly, I'm interested in social eating initiatives. And by that, I mean um, sort of places that use surplus food and have public meal times. Um, so they're different from conventional community cafes um, and they're different from food banks and social supermarkets um, and from going out. But they're almost like a hybrid spray space where we've got family eating, but in a public context. Uh, and it's very affordable, but at the same time, it's actually going out for a meal. So it's like a sort of hybrid model. Um, and my research particularly is interested in the practices of social eating. Um, and I've identified that there are a number of uh, practices that happen within social eating initiatives that distinguish them from, for example, community cafes or from food banks, and maybe place them in a different category rather than just food aid, charitable food aid. Um, social eating initiatives tend to have much more to do with sort of family meal times and what we call in academia commensality, which are group eating practices. So in some ways, what we're seeing is we've got a broader sort of issue in society at the moment with sort of, for example, food insecurity. But what we're seeing is a sort of very deep seated uh, social need, which is eating together being sort of modified and, and expressed then in modern society. So I'm looking at the particular practices. So I'm looking at the practices of eating together, uh, helping out again in social eating initiatives with lots of opportunities for people to get involved, which Charmaine I'm sure will be talking about later. Um, and what I call performances of care, of which you can also include socializing. So talking to each other, looking after each other, checking up on each other, giving advice, giving emotional support, um, friendly faces, meeting new people. Um, but my sort of research, that are going to be getting involved in is also the practices of managing new risks. So looking at how social eating initiatives are responding and have responded to the pandemic and what they're going to be doing going forward. So that's just my sort of broad research interests of part of my PhD. Um, I'm going to give you some context now. So some of you will be really familiar with this. Um, so I'm not going to spend ages talking about this, but of course, in modern day society, we have a very particular intersection of problems that we've got food insecurity, uh, coexisting with the industrial level wastage of food, um, but we also have the increased distribution and redistribution of surplus foods, which are foods that just aren't going to be commercially sold, um, and it's just food basically. Uh, it's not food waste, that's not how I see it. Um, it can become wasted, um, but surplus itself is a waste food. And of course we have the pandemic issue, which again has, for many of us, really, really concentrated um, the idea that Food and social connection are hugely important and actually there's some work that my colleague has done in Sheffield which seems to demonstrate that even regardless of income, people that uh, did well during the pandemic were people that were well socially connected. So again, we see that our food security in its broadest sense is really tied up with our experiences of being socially connected before. Um, and we've actually had a huge number of what I'd called emergent uh, food insecure people. So people that were on furlough or that had been made redundant or just couldn't get online or just didn't have enough money in the bank to stock stuff. So again, and we're probably gonna be seeing that later on in this year um, when furlough ends, that we're gonna see a load of people that have moved on to universal credit and are probably gonna be experiencing food insecurity as well. But I also sort of understand food security as not just your ability to access food that's aff um, affordable and available um, but actually also uh, your capacity to eat together with other people, because we see that genuine food security is also about food sharing and socialising. So I think work is looking at how we define what food insecurity is. Um, and we know that there's been a load of DEFRA funding that's come down to food banks and social eating uh, initiatives, um, groups like Fair Share. But this was to block buy sort of food. It wasn't surplus food. Um, and actually what that's happened is almost like created a situation where there's lots of food parcels uh, and that's not inherently problematic but it's not the same as actually meals and meal sharing um, and what we've also said, seen as I've said before is that 
social networks have absolutely been crucial. And what we saw is an enormous proliferation of mutual aid groups when the pandemic hit, which for someone like me, was I thought that was really optimistic that actually it was actually at a level of community and even just sometimes on the level of streets that basically people got together to support each other. And that was a really enormous response across the country. Um, and I think some local authorities that had well-developed community food sectors really realised what an enormous resilience and resource that was in their communities and actually what a, what a good um, investment of public money. Um, so I know some of you know about food security and, and some of you don't. Um, really what's happened in broader societies that we've individualised the problem and made it about people managing their budgets and that sort of stuff. And actually it's, it's a much broader issue the way that the welfare state has been rolled back and charity has been expected to sort of pick up those pieces. Um, and what happens when we individualize a problem is that we we sort of give it to people to solve it themselves. And actually individuals aren't going to solve these problems. Groups of people and communities are going to solve these problems. Um, and actually a huge part of food insecurity is not just being able to sort of access food in terms of nutrition and, and hunger. It's actually about being excluded from social life. So we know that eating together in groups, whether it's birthdays, feasts, celebrations, is an enormously important part of human life and human culture. And it exists across time and across every single society you will see people sharing food and eating together. It's this enormous social engine. Uh, and when people can't afford to eat together, it means actually they're excluded from a really import, important part of social life. And it means that they're excluded from making their contribution into that part of social life. Um, as I said, we're seeing a, you know, a huge round of newly unemployed people. Um, and also what we're recognizing is that we need a collective response. We need response at the level of community to sort of get down into at the street level where that need is. And so we've seen that the issue with the pandemic is not just the interruptions to the broader global, global food supply, it's actually how that's translated at the level of communities. And actually it's been communities across the country that have responded really effectively, sometimes because they're not hierarchical and they can, they're much more responsive and particularly because they're anchor organizations. Um, again, just very briefly, food wastage. So we've got industrial levels of food wastage in the UK and across the world. And I don't consider surplus food to be waste food. Um, it's perfectly good food, it's perfectly good to eat, but often it ends up being wasted because it can't be distributed through uh, the commercial channels. But what Fair Share, for example, which is a large scale um, food redistribution charity in the UK saw during the pandemic was that they got enormous amounts of surplus food that ended up on the system. So again, deliveries couldn't go to places, lorries got stuck in places where, you know, isolation, quarantine, lockdown. We also saw lots of catering businesses. And actually, so we saw amidst a lot of people experiencing hunger and being sort of food insecure, we also saw an absolutely enormous amount of food hit the surplus circuit. Um, and actually what's happened is that it's introduced lots of new audiences to surplus. So again, educating people about what surplus food is. It's not waste food, it's perfectly good food. And so again, it's, it's sort of engaging people in a new way um, around a debate which often sees sort of waste, uh, surplus food framed as poor people's food, which makes it sort of that people don't want to eat it rather than recognize it's perfectly good food. So that's the sort of context to what's been going on. Um, and my specific interest is obviously in social eating initiatives. And I consider them, and I'm sure Charmaine will know this, that these are anchor organisations that do a huge amount more than just feed people and engage people. They are crucial place and space based um, organisations that anchor communities together. Uh, and this has been absolutely demonstrated during the pandemic. Um, and they also have broad social networks. So again, it's actually about getting to those people out in community who they either already know or they are referred to them. They are the, they are the face, they're the friendly face, they're the welcoming face of community food. Um, and they've been absolutely crucial. Um, they've been able to lean on their already existing networks of people to make sure that communities are supported. Um, and actually they're engaging in new practices of commensality. So even though people can't eat together in person, What's happened is that that person delivering a food parcel or a meal has been that friendly face. They've been that personal connection between this broader issue and you know, the immediate issue that people are having in their everyday lives. And so we've seen this idea that people are still eating together, even though they're alone, because of the connecting factor and the role that social eating initiatives play. And I'm going to talk briefly about uh, Food Hall, or, which is one of the branches of the National Food Service. And I'll give a link for this at the end. 
again, they've really developed during the pandemic as lots of, lots of mutual aid groups set up to sort of mobilise and feed people in their communities, often using certain foods. And they might be described as a more than food movement. So they're looking at multiple issues. They're looking at food insecurity. They're looking at food wastage. They're looking at, you know, the space based space and, and place based stuff in communities. So physical spaces where people can congregate. Um, they're looking at mutuality, mutual aid. They're looking at sustainability and environmental issues. And so they're looking at lots of issues So we can call them a more than food movement. And this more than food movement of which National Food Service is a part really reckons that agency and power ought to be held within communities and actually is held in communities and it's at that level that these community agencies become these sort of interconnecting points between what's going on more broadly and what's happening very locally um, and they've done a lot of practical stuff like sharing risk assessments and sharing best practice very quickly so that groups that had to move from a social eating space into a delivery service had sort of adequate information to do risk assessments. And they also really operated as distributed services. Again, I'm sure my Charmaine will talk about is that they did a lot more working with lots of different partnership groups to sort of get food, to get plastic containers, maybe to link with taxi services to deliver food. So there was all this interconnected work going on very rapidly and very locally. So we can sort of describe them as, as running these distributed services rather than hierarchical top-down services. Um, so in terms of what we can take away from this is that with COVID-19, but also with the coming recession very likely to happen, with broader issues around climate change and food security more generally, we need social eating initiatives. They are absolutely crucial infrastructure within our communities that have more than demonstrated their worth during the pandemic. Um, and I think it's been really a sort of good for a lot of us that are involved in this space just to see how responsive and effective our groups were, but also to just demonst demonstrate really evidently, particularly to like funders and local authority and public health, that we are a crucial part of the sort of foodscape um, and, and that investment into these projects is, is future proofing, because again, social eating is, initiatives are gonna be needed for some of these broader challenges, even in a post COVID-19 foodscape. And what these groups have also really demonstrated and what my research really shows from working with participants is that pleasure, caring and socialising are really important. It's not just about the instrumental provision of food. People need much more than that and people want to offer much more than that. And actually, it's a whole form of currency um, that is really important in this sector uh, that, again, we ought to be mobilising. And what's also happened, I mean, particularly in Nottingham, is that we've seen, um, for example, city and county are very politically different and they have not really worked together wi widely um, before but what's actually happened during the pandemic is it's forced them um, to start working together uh, and again we've also seen uh, corporate public and charitable setups that have basically moved very rapidly because they've had to and actually it's about how do we reinforce and strengthen some of those relationships and how do we keep them going so just looking briefly about where we go next um, there are new risks, of course, in terms of how we actually manage to feed people and do we go back into social eating as we have before. Um, but there are also new opportunities. Um, and I'm interested to listen in during the breakout to think about, to listen to how you've uh, learned and responded to stuff. Um, and just looking, for example, here um, at Nottingham, we've got a load of redevelopment that's happening in the city around some of the city space. A big uh, shopping centre has now gone bankrupt and the city council has been left to think about how it can redevelop that space. And again, one of the things that they're looking at, because there, there's stuff on carbon neutrality and there's stuff on well-being and planning, also demonstrates that people want hangout spaces and they want green spaces and actually they want to eat together. And so if you want to solve a number of these complicated problems and how they intersect, social eating initiatives offer a model of um, working that, that solves a number of problems or responds to a number of problems. So, for example, we might be looking at things like eating outside more and having covered spaces, um, just like the commercial cafes have, so that people can sort of sit and eat outside in groups. Looking at things like bubble dining, so you book in on a table of six and you agree to sort of eat together and not move around the room as much. There's lots of practical stuff around, you know, increased hand washing and, and sanitisation and stuff around, you know, not queuing anymore, um, being served at the table and having a hybrid mix of food that goes out meals in terms of delivery, but also people coming and sitting and eating together. 
Um, so we're going to have to start to transition probably in the new year back towards some sort of physical getting together. But I think that that's going to be hybrid that we will still have um, meal delivery systems, but social eating initiatives will still be that point of contact. And in terms of strategy, it's really looking at things like a national food service is saying that they want to have investment. Um, and I've put an article at the end of here, um, which has got some links to this about having social eating uh, initiatives in, in every neighborhood or at least in sort of every uh, ward or district because they're using, utilizing surplus food and they're feeding everybody that wants to come and eat and they're doing much more than just feeding people. So again, if you wanna go out and eat somewhere an affordable place and you just wanna to go to a hangout space, not everybody wants to go into town or can afford to go into town or wants to go to the pub. So again, these spaces are, how do we attract people more broadly um, and I think what's happened is that lots of people have just recognised the value of community during the, the pandemic. And that's something that the groups want to capitalise upon and want to reinforce. And so some of the stuff that we're looking at, again, is, is some of the stuff around piloting. We're just um, having a discussion with Nottingham City Council at the moment about them using surplus, but cycling it through their large scale catering kitchens so that they make trays, catering trays of food that then get delivered rather than food or individual meals that they get the catering trays of food that get delivered to the social eating spaces so that groups don't have to do all the prep in the, cook, the kitchen which is sometimes risky for those small teams of volunteers and instead what they get is a large catering tray which they then heat and serve so the social eating initiatives can pop up in venues that don't have great kitchens but might have bigger spaces for people to socially distance so we're just looking at how can we deliver social eating more flexibly and how can we expand uh, the scope of social eating in cities given that we know it's addressing issues that we're having now and is also going to be addressing issues in the future. Um, I've put some resources here at the end um, and again I'm happy to share my email my Twitter handle is on there um, so that's just like a brief overview uh, of the work that I'm doing and hopefully Charmaine is going to talk in more detail about some of that work on the ground that they've been doing um, but yeah thank you very much for, for listening and, uh, and yeah thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Marsha. So, um, so if you have any questions or anything, keep them coming. Um, you can either put them in the chat and one of my colleagues will kind of make a note of that um, or um, just keep them, keep them in your mind. We will come back um, to Marsha with possibly some questions. I know I've got a few burning questions and I guess one of the burning questions I think has been mentioned in the chat a lot already is like, how can we keep the social element of social eating going during obviously even now stronger COVID-19 restrictions. So yeah, so let's have a chat about that, I think um, in a moment, but first, if I, um, if um, let's hear from Charmaine. Charmaine is, I think, a community developer in the Vine Community Centre in Nottingham. Uh, she's in an inner city Nottingham uh, community. Um, uh, and they have done loads of stuff over the last six months. Um, so do you wanna tell us a little bit about what has been going on there? Yeah, so um, good morning, everybody. So I'm from the Vine Community Centre Nottingham. We were able to run a food initiative. Um, it started in March when I actually started my new job at the Vine and it was a matter of we, we closed down the community centre or we do something. So the idea was to do this food initiative. It started off with me, um, you know, recruiting some volunteers and then um, putting it out there that we were here to support people in any way. And what came back was that people missed the Sunday lunches with their families and their friends and that connection. So we decided to have uh, a family Sunday meal and that would be a two course meal um, delivered um, and it would be fresh and it would be um, nutritious. One thing we found, because we are a very multicultural area, that um, we had a lot of um, Caribbean people that, you know, we, we, we weren't sort of supplying their food. So we spoke to a, a restaurant who then cooked at least 60 meals each week. We ended up cooking 150 meals every Sunday, delivered by 30 volunteers who picked the food up and delivered them across Nottingham. We... Um, so yeah, so that was that. Um, out from from that became what we've got today. Right now, we have the um, people from uh, who were self isolating being able to come out. To now we're self distancing in, the, in our big hall, and we're running sessions that they've shaped. They've been able to meet and talk about how it affected them, 
We've got counsellors on board doing one-to-ones. Um, they're running the sessions. We've got a drumming session going on right now. So what I'd like to do is show you the video of just a, a snippet of what we, we did. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Can I just show it now then? Do I just show it now? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna show this with you. can't see anything. Do you want me to share it? I've got it open as well. Yeah. Yeah, shall we do that? All right. Yeah. Oops. City Centre um, also entails um, doing a volunteer um, coordinator as well. So today we're doing the project which is the Sunday lunch um, and we're feeding... Um, most of the city, so it's like if you one straight through. What's going on? <laughs> NG8. Wow, we've had an amazing response. Um, we've, we've, like today, we've got 140 meals going out. Um, the demand for the Caribbean meals is, is really strong as well. Uh, we have volunteers that come in and deliver the food. Not, not only to deliver, but prep. We have volunteers cooking, volunteers cutting cake, um, dishing out custard, um, and then they go and deliver the food. I started doing the Sunday lunch deliveries and went out to one um, family, um, young person with children, and she was just so overwhelmed by the support that she'd had from the voluntary sector uh, and from the Vine um, Centre and she was in tears um, and just said that you know she couldn't have um, pulled through everything without the help that she'd had. When you go out there and you're and you're meeting people and you know you're, you're helping in like just a small way you realise how important it is those little little chats in the day those little uh, gestures. I'm loving it I'm, I'm, um, I'm volunteering for everything the guys will let me do at the moment they're sick of me taking over because yeah i'm off work with on furlough leave so without this i would just be sat at home doing nothing so yeah it's been really nice to be able to help like so many people some weeks we're doing 100 meals which is amazing so i've been in charge of um basically building up these packs so the thought behind these packs is that there are going to be a lot of children who are stuck at home who might not necessarily have the resources available to them um to do things that are fun that kind of keep their minds ticking while they're not at school. We've got one pack where they can make cards um, for people that they might not be able to physically see um, to kind of try and keep people connected. It's also obviously the the kind of craft activity of making them. So we um, also have a food bank. We work we're closely with the food banks, but we have a, um, an emergency um, storage at the, at the Vine where we give out to the clients who are most um, at risk or vulnerable. Um, and we also have the project where we have dog walkers um, and prescription collection and also our new newest project is the one with the clothes bank where we've got donations of um, naught to four year olds um, people donating clothes in and then we're giving out to um, clients who are struggling with their ever-growing children the fine's been really really great helping me um, they've been bringing me Sunday lunch every Sunday which is fantastic it means I see at least one friendly face a week um, they've been doing odd bits of shopping and they've been collecting my prescriptions for me. But yeah, it's such a relief not to have to cook. It gets monotonous cooking for one person, so just have one meal a week where you don't have to think about what can I cook today. It's really good, really great. Over this period, um, really, it's just coming, uh, helping out with um, with, with a meal, really. Um, and obviously, you know, knowing someone's there, if I need any help with like shopping or to get um, prescriptions or anything like that, just know that there's someone out there that's um, looking looking out for you, basically, because I'm registered as, um, as blind, I'm severely sighted. So having that support there from someone that, that's gonna be out there to help you is, is really good. So the thing that's brought to light for this whole COVID is how um, unconnected we were and how this has brought us all together. And I think going forward, it's something that we're going to have to look at because we've reached out to so many people that we wouldn't ordinarily reach to. And um, we've made an impact on them and they've impacted on us as well, which has really been nice. So if you was in need of this service, what you can do is get in touch with The Vine. If you can't get us, leave a message. We will always ring you back. And then we'll just have a friendly chat and find out, you know, how best we can support you. And 
and if, it, we, um, if we can refer, refer you to any other project, that's what we'll do. Sorry about that at the beginning, the teething problems. <laughs> Did everyone get to hear it? Can you put a thumb up? Oh, good, good. So I've just got a few statistics. Um, we were able to cook 2,548 meals. We supported 707 individuals. We rang them every Wednesday. We had a phone call where we would ring them and give them a choice of the meal because the meal was different every week. So it'd be, I don't know, shepherd's pie or roast chicken. And there was always that choice of a, a white meat, red meat and a vegetarian and the Caribbean. So we were going through that every single week. Um, and then they would get the face to the face to face contact on a Sunday. Out of that came dog walking prescription collections, letter posting, um, the baby clothes. We now run in, now, now, when lockdown finished, sort of like in, in August, we were able to find out what people wanted and they did want to have that connection. So we've started a, a drop-in and that happens every Thursday and it's happening right now. They've got a drumming session and they've shaped that. So each week, um, one of the clients will run the session or we'll get somebody in to do it. And I teach the aerobics. So I've got go in about 15 minutes to teach the the chair aerobics um so we're going to post the link if there's any other information you want i can give that that you'll have my email um but yeah if you've got any questions that'd be really great great really thank you. they're calling me so yeah quick questions <laughs> thank you Tremaine. so any quick questions for Tremaine? i i've i've got a quick one hi there that was really hi, inspiring you. hello um, yeah. I just wanted to ask, how did you fund your dinners and did you charge people for them or? We didn't fund, we wrote a funding application for Cap Castle Cavendish, so we got the funding for that and we didn't charge, it was a free meal, two course meal. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. Yep, let's speak, food. Hello, um, yeah, from, I, I was just wondering, and are the people's, um, were they kind of engaged already or were they new people that you'd managed to find? I don't know whether I missed that information. They were all, or, new, people. They all, were all people. new people that we managed to find. What we did, we worked with the councillors and they also gave us a bit of money because I was like, you know, these are your people. We, you need to help here. Yeah. And we got the volunteers to, to post leaflets through with um, vulnerable people that we knew were vulnerable. And we got phone calls. One day we came in, we had 50 messages on the phone, on the phone just for, for people wanting the meals. And just on, so would you like collect their kind of address to be able to deliver and, and was, yes. was, there, was that kind of secure, um, was that easy to kind of set up for your organisation or was that a challenge to, to be it's able easy to? easy for our organisation, I mean we're a small, very small organisation but I think in the climate that we were living in, I think at that time it was just let's get these people the food and let's get them supported and let's let's help, it wasn't about you know we did what we needed to do and everything's in the secure lockup and everything but you know that at that time it was these people that needed help and we just we did it yeah no it's amazing to see so yeah it's yeah. it's yeah really great great, great. We have some questions Can I add that... one more please go um, ahead and then we have some questions I... that came in over email okay sorry did i understand correctly that you did caribbean food like what they would usually eat how did you identify that need well my background is caribbean anyway and then i i looked at the food that they were they're cooking i i just wouldn't eat it it was something that i <laughs> they wouldn't eat as being as a caribbean person i just wouldn't eat things like toad in a hole for sunday dinner we have a set meal like um stewed chicken and rice and peas or yeah. cow food we, that, that's our caribbean culture and we have a different way of what how we prepare food so yeah. we were finding that people just weren't eating the food so I went and spoke to a, a local restaurant who provided the food. That's amazing I think yeah. you know adapting it to be culturally adequate was yeah. amazing really good job it'd Thank be interesting you. to know if other people find that as well that there is a need for different you know different I'm, types of food. I'm sure there would be Polish, yeah. um, African, yeah. I mean we all, we all eat differently and I think that is mm. it's homing in on and you know providing that just don't assume people want baggins and mash for sunday dinner yeah. you know yeah yeah it's great a, a, a very related question actually that that came in over email was about uh, someone from um 
the Lancaster People's Cafe asking about actually how easy is it to get people from different backgrounds into the same cafe and how do you put out the message that says that actually this is for everyone. Um, the person that asks the question says actually people often are very good at figuring out if that if that is something they see as their kind of place or not their kind of place. So I suppose the um, it's the mirror question to how do you make sure that that's the service you're providing, but how do you put that out into the community as well, that that's somewhere that all different communities are welcome. What we did, we, we were able to call every week, every Wednesday, we would call them and ask them, how did you enjoy your Sunday dinner? You know, what did you like about it? And they'd be like, well, I actually didn't like it. it was too salty or that's not my kind of food. So it's about just talking to people, you know, people are quite happy just to tell if they like it or not, you know. And you'll find, you know, especially Caribbean people, I used to get this old man who said, no, I don't want it this week. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't want it this week? So it's that cultural talk that you sort of have to sort of um, come out with as well sometimes. So I know my people, sometimes they'll say they don't want it, but there's a reason why I'm like, why don't you want it? Well, it's not what I want to eat. It's not what I eat. So you have to sort of say, well, what do you eat? And then and that's the way of doing it. So it's just digging and digging and, you know, till you get it and not just saying, okay, you don't want it. That's fine. Yeah. Is that okay? Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Charmaine. That was really, really inspiring. Um, and I think that's definitely um, a lot of good ideas there. And I have attended and, well, helped organize Christmas dinners, which included everything from curries uh, to turkey uh, to vegan food. So I think, um, yeah, I think that definitely something I've seen as a best practice of asking people and people will tell you if they don't like the food oh yes they will <laughs> but they also tell you when they do so i've got to go can... now so um yeah. if anyone needs um any advice or some you know if you share my email and i can give you information partners we worked with um you know how the process worked etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah so we will share that in the follow-up email so you can contact Charmaine um, after that. So thanks so much for coming on. I know there are people waiting for the exercise. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Bye. 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 Right. So um, I thought, obviously, we have got quite a few um, projects and people who are running projects in the room from across the country, which is really exciting. So um, we thought that maybe we start, um, well, I definitely still have a lot of question marks in the sense of what is it actually, what is best practice now? What did we learn? What are the things going forward we definitely want to go keep hold of um, and we want to tell people about the things, because I think for me at least in my community, it was a very rapid learning curve over the last six months or five months. So we just thought we might just now, um, put you into breakout rooms, so in smaller groups, so you can actually chat and uh, chat a little bit to each other and maybe share some nuggets, some gold nuggets about what you learned um, over the last five months with your projects or in your community, either as someone attending activities or as someone organizing activities, or as someone who's pretty new to all of this and um, what did it look like um, from the outside. Um, and then I think the other question we obviously Maybe then when we come back also may want to focus in a little bit is this social element of social eating. We know how important connections are and I think both Marsha and Charmaine's presentations really, really brought that home. We possibly have seen that at, um, in our own communities. How do we keep those connections going over the next six months? So if everyone is all right, what I might do now is I just pop you guys in groups of three or four people in let me just do that three or four people and um i will be main sorts of things you would like to share from your group discussion feel free to do that in the chat or you can also just unmute yourself now and just take the floor oh i can share a little bit from our group um we were talking about how it's quite difficult to organize any anything outdoors in Scotland where the weather can turn in an instant and especially with um, old, you know older communities and and how we can yeah how can we support each other socially eating when when something like the outdoors can also be a barrier and people might not come out at, you know at the risk of, of having um, 
yeah, it being too cold. And then also about how um, Christine, we were, we were talking really quickly at the end to try and squeeze it in before we came back. So we didn't really get, get to discuss it anymore, but um, how there's challenges in getting the COVID tests and, and the way that the sites are set up for cars rather than people walking, but also how those spaces could be even better for people uh, connecting over food. Um, but yeah, so we, we were just yeah start, starting to discuss that and, and how we've all kind of found it quite difficult to know what what's best for how we organize and you know it's it's been quite um confusing everything's been confusing and it's just kind of stopped people rather than encouraged anything community-based to, to carry on um i think we've all felt that really really strongly okay thank you i mean out of interest um just just because i'm, I'm involved with my own um with a with associating project well myself uh um whose project is still running or is running in a different way and which projects uh, if you run a project or involved with a project who is um yeah where things are really currently on hold right now I mean, just a show of hands so i know well my project is completely not running at the moment you're great yeah a few hands i see so a few projects which kind of are running or in different ways so okay cool yeah i think that's an interesting one isn't it the, the question around i think it, i've what we've seen so i work obviously with Eden project communities and we work with something called the big lunch which we had to turn into the virtual space and which is more it's not an it's not established regular meals but it's this invitation to share some food and company and connection with your neighbors once a year to kind of you know start this neighborly connection and we had to move it in the virtual world obviously during lockdown and yeah, I definitely I saw that as well, especially for the people who just kind of starting out uh, for them. That was, um, yeah, that was definitely a lot of barriers for them to participate. Great. All right. Um, any more questions or feedback from any other groups? No, no questions. So I well. Anne was going to speak, but then I haven't been able to hear you, Anne. Anne, unfortunately, we, we can't hear you. But if you have a question that you want to ask, you can pop it into the chat function and we can read it for you. No, I think Rosanna has a question. I just wanted to share uh, one of Janet's gems at the end. She squeezed it in when we were being dragged back to the, the main meeting. And I thought it was a really good tip to use the pharmacy. If you're already doing uh, like prescription collections, pop uh, a note about well, basically all sorts of information could go in that note because that gets to people um, almost under the radar is, was what I picked up from it. I don't know if I picked it up right, Janet, but... I thought it was a great idea. Thank you. Not necessarily about social eating things, but you know, have a, a community support group as well. And we're just about to do, or uh, well, they're just about to do a new leaflet. And I thought, oh, that's that's a great tip. We we need to try and take that on board as well for the support. Just yes, Jenna. Yeah, can I just quickly clarify that we were running a helpline. Um, it's to reach those that are so socially isolated that are often too proud to accept help or to be um, helped. And what we found was that a lot of them obviously respect their doctors and will take the advice from the doctors. Um, so we went into the pharmacies and when they were collecting their prescriptions, which they shouldn't have been doing, but were too proud to accept help, then we were having our number given to them. And it's amazing how many contacted us that wouldn't have not done. And it's just come to fruition that it's just a great way of getting to the, the older social isolated people that wouldn't, that are literally too proud to accept help. So top tip, <laughs> that's what we did. Great, thank you. Great, so I keep, keep, it, keep the floor just open if anyone wanted to have any other things they wanted to share from the group discussion for another minute or half a minute. I was just going to add, I'll share a link from Food for Life get-togethers, which is uh, all about social eating and, and you know, 
grassroots organizing how we can support that as a as an organization uh, we've just released and FAQs on how people can still get together in bubbles of six and how um, the government's I, I'm in the north so it's all local lockdown so I can't really do this but where local lockdowns might not be happening um, that there's still ways that community groups and voluntary based organizations can meet and can organize so social eating could be something that is possible and I'll, I'll share that um, FAQs with you in the chat. And there's also a, a small grants link that I've had and our next grant is for something around, um, yeah, the, the kind of festive season to really look at how can we share foods and, and connect either virtually or in small bubbles. So hopefully if someone, you know, needs some 150 pounds is what it is, but it, hopefully that can help you get the ingredients or cover the travel costs to deliver. Um, so I hope that's in the chat for you now already. I sent it whilst we're in the breakout rooms, but I think it goes into the main chat. But I'll show you. <laughs> Great, oh, thank I, you. Sorry, I was just going to mention we got some funding at Active Wellbeing, where we run community cafes um, from Food for Life to get people together. Unfortunately, our cooking, growing, and eating course was about to start when COVID happened. So at the moment, we are putting together recipe bags um, that we're sending out to people. We're trying to use seasonal produce, produce and surplus produce. And we've got apple pie kits, crumble kits that people are cooking. And they can send us photos, share it at home or cook something for a neighbour as well. It's really nice. But I think we've got to start thinking about, I like the idea of these bubble dining, you know, getting some people actually together in the church halls or community centres as well. Um, yeah i think that's the next step trying to physically distance people but get them in a room together eating so great thank you vicky and yes i think um we're going to uh wanted to talk a little bit about uh, food for life get togethers actually at the announcement bit as well because in project communities we're working with food for life get togethers this um we are uh well this year and well for a few more years actually and obviously the whole aim behind this partnership was um yeah to bring social eating to more groups and communities and um specifically bringing people together um and yeah we definitely uh so this year we decided we go ahead with world food day which is on the 16th of um, october um celebrating world food day together and either in the virtual way uh with you know having virtual lunches which can be a bit awkward but if you do them right and if you may have nibbles or so it can work if you uh with people in your community you might haven't seen for a while or with the volunteers you normally work with but also yeah just um how um yeah we're still possible and i think the areas are getting smaller and smaller uh, by the day where you can still meet in smaller bubbles or in small groups um how to do that possibly outside and uh so yeah so um i don't know sophie if you may want to just share some of those links and we will include all the links that um, have been shared about the little grants and the food for life get together where to follow up email there so i have one question actually and that comes from i think and someone mentioned that in the chat how do we because i feel a lot of these ideas of so some i have been involved with community christmases or organizing local community christmases for quite some time uh and um which was always um the idea was always as a social eating activity of like you know it's not about um, oh, you poor person, you don't have anyone to spend Christmas with, but more like, hey, come and join us. We have this great community Christmas celebration. And I really struggle with this idea of translating this now into something which isn't doing things to people, but with people. I really struggle with this idea of how to, yeah, change things in a way that don't, yeah, I don't know, move the balance too far down the line of, oh, and here is a service delivery. I don't know if anyone had any experience or any best practice or things they did to continue doing things with people rather than to people. Something happened where I am, uh, just up on my street where, where someone brought out a large speaker and started playing music in, a, in the local community. It's a small town. There was a circulate thing called Singing at Six. Uh, none of us actually sang, but 
it was the catalyst of something that was really um, well, just amazing for, for, for me, being a father with my daughter on my own and for all the kids on the street and all the people. Now, that was a small community thing, but it was really successful and things like food became part of that. And then um, naturally, and also what you're talking about with regard to the um, people meeting up at Christmas, we can see that formulating kind of naturally in our community. But again, um, yeah, facilitating it for a wider community, that's that's a big big challenge, isn't it? I think it it it, it probably differs on, on the size of the community you live in as well, you know, and, and, and the communal space is available. Um, yeah. I don't know if what I've said is relevant, but that's all I'm going to say and let someone else take take the rest. Thank you. And oh, um, Emma, I saw you have your hand up there. Sorry, I didn't see. Yeah, it was only, it's it's okay. It was it was a bit on like on the back of what you like. What was on the? It was from Anne really because I saw Anne, Anne hasn't been able to speak, and she'd put on the chat about things exactly what you said about things being done to people rather than with people. And I suppose in our community, what we've seen straight away as soon as lockdown came, that many organisations and putting food out there, which has been really good, but like distributing food. But the trouble is it has been what I see, it has been, and some people have taken it this way, it's been done to people rather than sort of with people. And what I'm hearing from people in our community at the moment with restrictions and everything else, there is no space to actually go and meet people that you want to meet with. Because if we've got no cafes in the community that are open at the moment, we've got no community centers that are open. And so us as a church, what we're planning on doing in the next few weeks is opening um, like a pop-up cafe in our church, but for the, purpose, for the purposes of perhaps people meeting one another and to try and create that social, just recognizing that food or drink, you know, it creates like a social, um, social aspect to it but we're intentionally even though we're in a community that's deemed as poor we're intentionally going to be charging for that um, and actually um, not to make a profit from it it will all go any profits that's made that will go back into the community but just more so that people see the value you know it's not something that's done for them to them as a service but rather they're actually buying into the service out of choice like that rather than um, rather than the other way around um, Pat. Am I I'm mute? <laughs> no, I'm muted now. Go for it. Well, quickly, quickly, um, an idea on what you said, which is actually an issue, I guess, in local communities, is to incorporate the food sharing with some outdoor physical activity. Because I don't know in England, but here we are allowed to do outdoor organized physical activities like walks, cycles, in, keep fit in the park and things, as long as the proper distance is, of course, respected. And people are nowadays asked to bring their own snacks and their own water, of course, but uh, there is always a 10, 15 minutes break in these activities that allows people to consume their snacks and chat socially. Great. And Pat, do you want to tell us where you're based? Because you said over here. So uh -huh. you're not in England. Glasgow. <laughs> oh, in Glasgow. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you think I was dialing in from Italy or something there? <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Glasgow. Yeah. Glasgow. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, great. Um, any more comments on that or ideas to share? And I just wonder, I mean, it was really helpful actually to have the, yes, I'm coming to you, Christine, and the FAC as well. It was really helpful to, to know Food for Life Get Togethers have some guidance uh, now around how to bring people or continue bringing people possibly together. I don't know, I wonder, and I, I might just go to that to Marsha in a second after Christine, uh, so I'll give her the forewarning, if there is any other guidance you know of or anything uh, that could be helpful for people who may think about bringing some form of activity back into the physical world. But over to you, Christine, now. Hi, uh, uh, as, an, uh, as an artist in my, in Stoke-on-Trent here, there are different projects 
we, and a lot of the projects that creatives make are actually to do with food as well because they're very aware that that brings people to their art projects and then they can share the art better so I'm just wondering how much of that's going on in all the different places I mean I know different things about different cities and obviously I know more about the art stuff but I don't always know about the food thing the social food things um, and my project is real for creatives um, it's called art lunch and it's on facebook as a group if anybody wants to come and join us it's a public group so and my project's only on zoom at the moment so it's very safe um, and you bring your own food at the moment so obviously i'm trying to find ways of getting us back together again um, but it's i think it's difficult when you're you're all individuals, but one of the things that we normally do is bring and share. So there's no, I mean, with that you've got your, you've got no risk, have you, in your, in your own kitchen preparing the food, and then you're bringing it, but we can't share it. So that's that's the tricky one to get around. Um, it's quite interesting hearing um, from Chris, I don't know where Chris Wilson is based, saying about yeah. the music. I mean, they did, they've they tried, I mean, that's the thing that's frustrating me as well, because I can't hear the musicians. Normally people that I connect with, my art pro lunch project, sorry, I'm waffling, um, connects all creatives, poets, musicians, sculptors, painters, everyone, it connects everybody. And sometimes even, you know, Joe Bloggs public sort of, we sort of say they've, they've sort of joined in when it's when it's popped up somewhere. So I think that's, that's the main thing. We all need to connect much more and, and bring all these projects, you know, together really much more. Um, I don't know what people think about that, but I think you can, I think we've got to be more confident, haven't we? Just go outside, if you play an instrument, go outside and play it. I've seen people in this city during the lockdown set up um, and start singing outside on their on their lawn. You know, there have been um, B Arts in this city, have done a few projects, the poets have gone out and done things, you know, so they're not they're not afraid to try it. I think that's maybe what we need to do. Um, yeah. And stop walking. <laughs> no, but it sounds, it, there, there is something about risk, isn't there? And uh, it's something about getting used to doing things in a new way. Um, but, but yeah, there is something about getting it out out of the usual way you do, the, you do deliver your projects or your activities. I definitely think that there's something I struggled with. Um, uh, and I think we all do in a way because we want to keep those things going. So, right, we're slowly coming towards the end of our session. So before we do, I just wanted to go back to this question to Marsha, if she knows of anything which is of, you know, which could be of value for people to share about how to deal with all this. I mean, I just heard Liverpool has now new restrictions as well. It feels like definitely check the government website on a daily basis. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can just give some overview things in terms of the very practical things that people have been doing to manage the risk and to continue social eating in some form. So one of the things was just looking at what are the risk points. So coming into a building, um, sort of having extra hand sanitising and people cleaning the things like the doors or having the door pegged open, stuff like not queuing. So people have a greeter that comes in that has a mask asking people to wear masks when they come in and they're going and sitting on tables of six so that they either book in beforehand and someone had asked in the chat about how they do that. There's a variety of ways that people do it. They, they call or they email or they just let the organizers know that they're definitely coming. Um, and so that they're limiting the amount of people that can come into that space. And so they're doing a sort of booking system, of like say 30 people each week where normally it'd be like 80 or 100. Um, and then rotating that so people get a chance to come. Um, so they're not queuing. Um, again, they're going and sitting down and having the food orders taken at the table and brought to the table. And just stuff like, you know, taking cash, they're just using gloves and, and using some disinfectant and stuff like that. But I would do and things like minimising the small teams of people that are working in the kitchen. So maybe they're doing the prep out in a hall on tables instead. 
but I'd also say that most people that are willing to come out and engage in social eating physically aren't people that feel vulnerable. So I think, again, having a one way system that comes around, getting people to sort of bubble dine to book in on tables of six and asking them not to move around, but just sit to stay with those people, getting rid of the queuing system and just having some extra hygiene checks in place is managing the risk. And that's pretty much as good as you're going to get it at the moment. So I think some of it is just having the confidence to recognise if you're, as long as you're being sensible and following the government guidelines, people also have to assess their own levels of what they think is acceptable risk. But also if we look at VE Day celebrations in, in, the, in the country, every, loads of people came out and they were happy to do that. So again, people just sitting out on the street with a, a jumper on and a hot water bottle uh, and sitting and eating or having a drink or a cup of tea with people is still doing that I mean people came out to clap the NHS they came out into the street and then ended up chatting and that sort of stuff so it's almost if you can't do it in a physical space maybe trying to organize it so that people come and do it going on a walk or having a bonfire or going to an orchard all of those things can be done outside um, and again I think people that you have to just ask that they're going to book in you can't control what every single diner is going to do but you can have some sort of ground rules that you ask people to follow that way you've covered your own liability um, and you've done a risk assessment to, to sort of ensure that it's as safe as possible. And this isn't going to last forever. It's about um, managing and maintaining those links in the meantime um, and just thinking about what is sensible, what do you feel comfortable doing? Um, and I think that's really what we're going to have to look at for the next six months. And that's what lots of our groups are doing, is that they're just having uh, dining in, they're moving into larger spaces, maybe larger community halls or, or sort of partially outdoors and that sort of stuff. So they can just have more distancing, knowing that they will be getting back to sort of hopefully some form of regular social eating sort of maybe next year. Um, and we'll have to see again what happens, but I think that's what we can do. And they're also still maintaining meal distributions, phone calls and those other things for people that can't come out. But for those that can and do want to and are absolutely desperate, some of them for for those things to sort of restart. Um, yeah, that's the practical things that we can do. Great. Thank you, Marsha. And I think that's a yeah, I think this is a really, really positive thought to kind of finish off, possibly. I, I think if this will not last forever or this also pass, I think that's I don't know what the English translation is, but it's definitely something in, in my, in my uh, native language in German. This is something I keep in my mind um, during difficult times. Um, but also this idea of doing both, because I think we started doing cake and chats on the door for the people who do not want to come out. And actually the neighbors started to come out. And so we created this connection between the person who we thought, you know, wanted to have a chat. And then the neighbor came out as well. And I think there are some really great ideas coming out now. Um, so I would just um, invite you as we come towards the end of the session, obviously, yeah, just to, to continue sharing. So hopefully we might organize a similar space um, at maybe early next year again, um, just to kind of see what ideas um, have been coming out and, and just if there's any anything more we can share. We will be sharing all the presentations, the chat, all the links, everything people announced or shared. So if you have any last minute things you want to share, please put them in the chat so we can we can share those with um, with everyone afterwards. And also, um, you might have seen that Sophie put in our survey, which doesn't take long, just two or three minutes, um, and it just to help us to understand better if those sessions are useful for people and also if there are any other topics people feel like we, we should need to have a space to talk about. And I think that's pretty much it from me. So thank you so much again um, for everyone for joining. Thank you for Marsha for coming and sharing everything she um, learned over the last five months and um, giving us a good overview. And yes, and then I hope to see, see you soon at some point. Good luck with, with all your projects or ideas. And yes, we will get through that. And there will be times when our communities will thrive and come together again in bigger parties. And while we do stay in bubbles, let's get them eating together in little bubbles. So thank you so much. <laughs> Bye.